Hello, my name is Ed Hope, a junior doctor in the UK, and I'm continuing my look at This Is Going To Hurt, the BBC medical TV drama. This is episode three. We're gonna be reacting to the medicine, breaking down some of the scenes, and sharing some of my stories of being a doctor in the NHS. Viewer's discretion on this one, as it's set on the label ward, so we're gonna be seeing babies being born, operations, and also potentially some upsetting scenes. With that out of the way, let's check it out. Hey, someone, stop trying to doctor. A GP. Dentist. <laughs> Trainee dentist. <laughs> Dr. K, you lying little rascal. I don't know anyone that I work with that wouldn't want to help here, as we see with the GP. My suspicion is just in the writing, they're trying to make the character look a bit cool, like he doesn't care, like Dr. House. If you spread out the surface area of your lungs and put them on a football pitch, that's an instant red card and a direct free kick. <laughs> These are really quite tender moments between Dr. Adam and the baby that he delivered early. Clearly this is part of his guilt and also his therapy that he's talking to the baby. In an ideal world, he'd have time off and counseling offered. I can see there's an argument that he's not helping himself by not reaching out, but I think that's part of the culture too. And although things aren't perfect in medicine, I think things like this have improved a little bit over time, but by no means perfect. The Secretary of State, for God knows what, is coming around tomorrow, so I'm assuming that we all want to keep our jobs. They almost think the entire NHS smells like fresh paint. <laughs> this is one of the things the show does really well, actually. In between the drama, it shows a lot of the day-to-day -day stuff. In this case, a pretty accurate handover between the midwife and the healthcare assistance team. So the incoming staff and outgoing staff have a handover with a senior midwife coordinating. They'll talk about any major issues during the shift, a rundown of the current patients on the ward, and they'll also assign members of the staff to different areas. That's so funny that they mentioned the walls being painted here because last time I saw a big paint job in my hospital, everyone was, you know, whispering amongst themselves, wondering if we were about to have a special visit. I don't think we did in the end, but I can imagine it is accurate, but it's also in the minds of all healthcare workers because we do have regular visits that things are slightly different in a good way, maybe uh, we're about to be visited by a VIP. Traditionally, at this point, a couple of you will be running to the emergency. Oh, we usually wait a bit. It's faulty, it randomly goes off for a couple of seconds. If it keeps going, we'll run, but normally it just... <laughs> Pretty accurate. Yeah, most of the time when alarm goes off in A&E, you hear someone shout false alarm a few seconds later, usually because a patient has pressed it, thinking it's a light switch or something. And it's a weird boy who cried wolf situation because even though this happens, <laughs> you can never ignore the emergency alarm. Anything the matter? No, no, just here for delicious food. How <laughs> soundproof do you think that thing is? So how can I help you today, Mrs. Winnaker? Yeah. It's pretty impressive the technology we have in the hospital, isn't it? These curtains that are 100% soundproof. It's not like you're telling the doctor your most personal information with the pure illusion of privacy. Nothing to panic about. You've got a bit of a prolapse there. That's your uterus you can feel coming out. And so we find out the patient has a prolapse of the uterus, so a bulging into the vagina, as we hear extremely common, usually as a result of weakening of the pelvic floor muscles after childbirth, being overweight or advancing age. It may not cause any symptoms, but if uncomfortable, like we are hearing here, then one of the possible treatments would be using a pessary in the vagina, so a rubber ring to help hold the uterus up in place. And actually, in a later scene, we go on to seeing the pessary being inserted. And I really like it when shows cover issues like this. It helps demystify medicine, because if it happens to you or someone you know, it might be really scary. You might not know quite what's happening. You might be concerned it's something more serious. So these type of things bring it into the public consciousness, kind of helps to deal with some of the stigma and just helps people understanding of their bodies. If anything changes, just come back in and see us. I mean, we are never closed, unfortunately. Stop. No, look, the sticker's on our file. Oh shit. That's a domestic abuse alert, right? In the ladies' toilets, there are red stickers that you put on your notes if you want to talk privately about domestic abuse. This is a very nice touch. Domestic abuse and violence, including coercive control, is a huge, huge problem. Cannot stress this enough. 30% of it starts in pregnancy too. 
probably made even worse given the pandemic. And this was drilled into me when I was a junior doctor on Obs and Gynae and we'd routinely asked to see the patient on their own without their partner to make sure everything was all right at home. And usually we'd be pretty good at making an excuse to do that. Uh, the stickers. Stickers! Oh God! <laughs> He's always doing this sort of thing. Sticky stickers! He loves stickers. <laughs> sorry, just sorry. I am um, so, uh, glad, glad to put you. Um, I was just discussing your case a bit more with my colleague, and we thought that it'd be best to keep you in overnight for a test. Uh. What? Shruti, the SHO, is the most junior person here, so doesn't have the authority to do this. You don't have the authority, Jackie Weaver. What she's doing may, in fact, be the right thing to do for the patient, but she shouldn't promise this because if, if she gets overruled by another doctor, then the patient's gonna be disappointed and maybe lose a bit in faith in the system, feel like she's getting mucked around a little bit. Especially since the registrar has reviewed her and she said that things were fine at home. I'm guessing Shruti didn't think that was an honest answer because they didn't have enough time because the child ran in. So Shruti really should have been assertive at the time to make sure they had an opportunity to get a real clear answer that everyone was happy with. But as we said, Shruti doesn't have the authority at this point to offer the patient an acute hospital bed. If she was still super concerned, she could find another excuse to talk to the patient privately or even escalate it to the consultant. Good news, we found you another room. There's even a pool in there for water there. And can I still eat my placenta? Sure, why not? Can I eat my placenta? Patients are well within their rights to have their placenta and do what they like with it, including eat it. Definitely one of those things you hear a lot more about than actually happens. I've seen loads of articles in the news, even heard celebrities like Kim Kardashian have done it. But in my four months of obs and gynae, I didn't see one woman request it. And you probably won't be surprised to hear that the general medical consensus is there's no good evidence to support eating your own placenta. Can I ask what you're doing here? Sorry, we uh, we did meet before, but it was, yeah, it was only briefly. Um, I'm the doctor who delivered your nephew. I know exactly who you are. That's why I'm asking if it's appropriate for you to be here right now. So Dr. Adam is met with some hostility from the woman's family and you know, you can f see both sides of it. You can feel his pain and you can you can understand where they're coming from. I think when you make a mistake, you so desperately want forgiveness and to make it up to people. And you just want to do that quickly. But sometimes all you can do is apologize and give them space. It's just since I've been pregnant. It's not his fault, he's not a bad man. What's changed since you've been pregnant? <sighs> Ernie can be a real handful. And his work so stressful at the moment. He didn't mean to. And will you let me wow. Out? Okay. This show doesn't get any flipping easier, does it? Regardless of the strange process that this woman has ended up in hospital overnight, Shruti was correct in her suspicion that she was a victim of domestic abuse. And Shruti shows great maturity here dealing with an intensely sad and difficult situation. She acknowledges the woman's concerns, but also in her response in offering to help, it's implicit that this is not acceptable and the patient does not deserve this. So we've seen some really difficult moments for Shruti throughout the first few episodes, which is very realistic for an SHO. Don't forget in your first few years as a doctor, you rotate every four months, so you're constantly out of your depth struggling to deal with lots of new things. So moments like this, although painful to endure with the patient, the sense that you've made a difference makes all the other struggles easier to deal with. And I, I can still eat my placenta after this. You're, you're not gonna take it away. That's a question for the midwives, not me, I'm afraid. Yeah, it is. It's perfectly natural. Dogs do it. They also eat their young and fuck the furniture. <laughs> Dr. Adam making his opinion on placentophagy very clear. I've criticized the humor of this show a few times in the previous episodes, but I don't mind it when he breaks the fourth wall because it's like his inner dialogue and it's not like he's actually treating the patient like this professionally. I can imagine though, as a viewer, particularly if you are into eating your placenta, that this still doesn't come across too well. But yeah, his opinion aligns with the medical consensus. So there's nothing wrong in stating what he should do, but it's just, how you go about it. You should never 
sort of take the mickey out of people or as I said before make the patient the butt of the joke just to deliver a message and make them feel bad about things. You've got a bit of a tear here. Suture, needle holder, scissors, large swabs. Thanks. And it is very common to have some tearing down below during delivery and then to require stitches like we see here. The show is doing an excellent job at covering the variety of procedures that obs and gynae doctors do. Placenta. Isn't this the placenta? No, that's blood clots from inside your... Oh, okay, so uh, this new mum is mistaking blood clots for the placenta. I mean, I thought eating the placenta was bad. Eating blood clots, even a worse idea, probably just because it's going to make you vomit a lot. <laughs> and as we predicted, there it is. <laughs> And just like real life, the cardiac arrest bleeps tends to go off when you least want it to. As with all the medical scenes we've seen in this show, this is filmed to perfection. It could literally be a cardiac arrest that I've attended. As you can see, it's probably a lot calmer than you'd probably expect and probably that you see in the movies. One thing that may surprise you is that the cardiac arrest team is generally made of the on-call medical team and they'll be covering the whole hospital. So it makes total sense that they won't necessarily know the patient. And so it's only when Dr. Adam arrives here that gives a brief history and is able to update the team on the background of the patient. Only small difference that we see nowadays is that we'd have pads that we stick on from the defibrillator. So I'm assuming back then they'd be using handheld paddles. Oh, for God's sake. This patient has a valid do not resuscitate form. Is everybody happy to stop CPR now? And we go on to find out that the patient has a do not attempt cardiopulmonary resuscitation order. So they are right to stop chest compressions. CPR and defibrillation is not a magic bring you back to life switch like we often see in the movies. It's a significant physical trauma on your body to have tubes down your throat, chest compressions and electric shocks. and it doesn't stop the underlying process that has got you into a cardiac arrest. And when your heart stops, even with good CPR, your organs are still gonna be starved of oxygen, meaning you're gonna need to stay on ICU afterwards for organ support if we manage to get your heart going again. So all these things together means you're gonna to have to be pretty fit to survive a cardiac arrest. And for that reason, in some patients, it's just not in their best interest to do it. She was absolutely fine yesterday. I um, fitted her a pessary, she was up We're in bed talking. We're not going against the do not resuscitate order authorised by the patient. Are you happy to certify death? Bit of a medical mistake that slipped through the net here. This is death confirmation, not certification. So confirmation happens at the side of the bed where we're checking for signs of life, such as breathing, heart sounds, pulse, pupil reaction. And you are mainly documenting that the patient has died and the time and place. Certification happens at a later date when you fill out the death certificate, and that is mainly concerned with the cause of death as well as the date and time and enables the family to register the death. When you are the on-call doctor, like the cardiac arrest team here, as we said, the vast majority of patients you haven't met before. So it can be a really difficult experience to meet someone for the first time and you're confirming their death. And as we're depicted here, they have the mood pretty much bang on. It's a real strange tranquility in that moment to be alone with someone who's just died. And it's even stranger when you're running around moments before involved in, you know, doing cardiac arrests and seeing patients that are coming acutely unwell. And then you have these moments here. It's a, a a real roller coaster. One little touch I do appreciate is this stethoscope here. These are the really naff, flimsy ones that are often hang it on the cardiac arrest trolley. And Dr. Adam, being an obs and gynae reg, wouldn't routinely carry a stethoscope, so he's obviously got it from the cardiac arrest trolley and he's needing it to confirm the death. So there's a little bit of storytelling in that there. She's fannying around, clearly doesn't know what she's doing. Uh, why don't I get someone else to come in and do the scan then? Yeah? Just do your little tests. 
Oh, oh my word, scary, scary moments with the husband being aggressive. And again, Shruti handles it very calmly. Speak to anyone in the NHS and they'll have stories of aggressive patients and relatives. In this situation, Shruti really should have got out the room quicker when she had the chance. It's not your job to put yourself in danger. So it's time to get you and Ernie somewhere safe. I don't need somewhere safe. Anna, you don't have to put up with this anymore. He only got angry today because it was all taking so long. You told me that he... <clears throat> Mummy's just going to the toilet. And it's another sad but realistic end to the story. From the victims of domestic violence I see in the emergency department, most of them do not want to report it to the police. They just want to go back home with their partner. And as much as Shruti has done an excellent job, she is also coming to terms with people's autonomy over their decisions, even if those decisions are bad for them. So there you have it, another tough, tough watch. It's certainly not afraid to deal with the harsh realities that people go through, both the patients and the healthcare professionals that treat them. I'm gonna leave a link in the description and a pinned comment for anyone concerned about domestic abuse. I hope you got something out of my breakdown of this episode. I'm gonna continue watching the series. If you want me to keep recording my thoughts, then give this video a like and a comment and it helps let me know. On that note, thanks for all the support on the channel. I hope you're all well and I'll be back soon.